Welcome to Prospective Doctors MCAT Podcast, brought to you by Med School Coach. Each week, Sam breaks down the highest yield MCAT topics so you can score as high as possible on test day. Hello and welcome to Prospective Doctors MCAT Basics with your host, Sam Smith. The goal of this podcast is to cover the highest yield topics on the MCAT and provide you with some sort of insight into the questions that the MCAT really likes to ask. This podcast is going to cover motivation and emotion. First, I'm going to go through motivation. I'll define motivation. I'll talk about intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. Then I'll introduce theories of motivation. And then lastly, I'll talk about addiction and harmful behaviors. You know, what motivates people to do these harmful behaviors. And then lastly, I'll talk about emotion, and again, I'll define it. I'll talk about emotion in context of the brain, talk about which areas of the brain are most involved in emotion. I'll talk about theories of emotion. And then lastly, I'll talk about emotional disorders that you're most likely to see on the MCAT. This will include depression, anxiety, bipolar, and obsessive compulsive disorder. This material is going to show up in one out of the four sections. That's going to be the psych soch section. And I would say out of all this material, the theories are probably what's most high yield. Um, This stuff is, you know, I'm a little bit boring. I'm not in love with psych soch to begin with, but um, it's important material. Uh, These theories are kind of interesting, and uh, hopefully this helps as you're studying for the MCAT. All right, so the first thing I want to talk about here is motivation. So motivation is defined by psychology today as the desire to act in service of some goal. And so essentially motivation describes the, the why to our actions or, or, or describes why we are doing something. Um, so it is the urge to behave or act in a way that will satisfy certain conditions like wishes, like desires, or like goals. And so some of the older theories of motivation talk more about the cognitive reasons as to why we act. You know, they say that rational thought and reason were really the guiding factors of human motivation. However, today the newer theories go more into basic human impulses and instincts, and they say those are really what drives us to act. Those are really our motivations. So before I dive into the motivational theories, You first need to understand the difference between extrinsic and intrinsic motivators. Intrinsic motivators are motivators that arise from internal factors. Basically, you're motivated to do some activity because you want to do it. You're motivated by yourself. Whereas extrinsic motivators are motivators that arise from external factors. You're motivated to do some behavior by some factor that's outside of yourself. So take, for example, books. So I like to read books that are historical fiction. So I'll buy those books and I'll read them because that's what I enjoy doing. And I am intrinsically motivated to do that. However, why would I be motivated to read a book on the U.S. healthcare system? The book basically reads like a textbook. It's a little bit boring, but I got through it. And why would I be motivated to do that? Well, that is because I want to be able to understand the U.S. healthcare system and be able to talk about it at interviews for medical school. And so I am extrinsically motivated then to read that textbook about the U.S. healthcare system. And this is an extrinsic motivator because it comes from outside myself, right? I'm not reading this book for pleasure. I'm reading it to then meet the goal of being able to talk about the U.S. healthcare system. So with that, let's get into the theories of motivation. I'm going to talk about seven different theories here. I'm going to talk about the evolutionary theory, arousal theory, drive reduction theory, incentive theory, the needs or three needs theory, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And then lastly, I'll talk about the opponent process theory, which can be used to explain why people engage in harmful behaviors like drug addiction, um, or even skydiving, which isn't necessarily a harmful behavior, but obviously if it goes wrong, it can be very harmful. And here's the situation that I want you to think about that I'm going to try to apply each of these theories to. The situation is that a lot of people go and exercise or lift weights. 
And so why are people motivated to lift weights? It seems kind of like a, a dumb task, right? If an alien were to come and just know nothing about the human race and come look at somebody lifting weights, they're going to say, what the hell are they doing? They're picking up heavy objects and lifting them off of their chests or you know, squatting down, picking them up. Why are they doing this? What's their motivation? It seems, seems stupid. So I'm going to apply the situation of lifting weights to each of these and talk about what each of these motivational theories would say the reason is why I go and lift weights. All right, so let's start with evolutionary theory. So evolutionary theory says that individuals are motivated to engage in behaviors that maximize their genetic fitness, i.e. it says we are motivated to make decisions based upon whether the outcome will help us pass on our genes or have more babies. And so in terms of our weightlifting scenario, the evolutionary theory would say that I am motivated to lift weights because it's going to help me reproduce and pass my genes on. And and how is it going to help me do that? Well, you could argue that um, it's going to help me be more healthy, live longer, therefore I can reproduce more. Um, Maybe it's going to help me attract a mate, or maybe it's going to help me fight off what I see to be predators, which again is going to make me live longer, which is going to be make me be able to reproduce more. And you know, I got to admit that probably all of these different motivators that I just described have somewhat of a role in motivating people to go work out. Um, you know, obviously, you want to live longer, you want to be healthy, and call me a douchebag, but I think that looking attractive is at least maybe a few percents of my motivation to go work out. And then lastly, of course, there's always in the back of your mind thinking, okay, what if I get in a fight at some point um, and need to fight for my life or whatever it may be? You know, the stronger, the more fit I am, I could put myself in a better situation to survive. And so in the back of my mind, that also may be a little bit of motivation to go exercise, although I can't say that I ever consciously think about it. All right, the next theory I want to talk about here is called the arousal theory. And it says that individuals are motivated in order to maintain an optimal level of arousal. And by arousal, I mean a heightened physiological state. And this theory says that each individual has their own optimal level of arousal that they like to maintain. And so this gets a bit into describing why some people are motivated to do risky things like skydive. You could say that those people have a higher level of arousal that they need to maintain. And I almost like to think about this as like a sinusoidal curve. You can almost think about it as like homeostatic temperature regulation or something, right? So your body wants to keep its temperature at a certain level. Well, in order to maintain that level, it's going to kind of go up over it a little bit and then go back down and go under it a little bit and go back up and go over it again, right? It's going to have this kind of sinusoidal pattern because you can't just keep your body perfectly constant all the time. So you're going to have it go up, down, up, down. It's kind of like that, right? You're trying to maintain this level of arousal that you uh, like. And so to do that, you're going to engage in behaviors that go up and over. And at that point, you're going to say, oh, shit, I need to calm down. You're going to go down below that level of arousal. Then you're going to have to do something again to get that um, arousal up. And so you engage in whatever risky behavior it is, you go up again, and you're just kind of trying to maintain this optimal level. And that's what motivates your behavior, or so would say the arousal theory. And so what would the arousal theory say uh, about my motivation to go lift weights? Well, it would say something like this. It would say that me lifting weights is going to maintain my optimal level of arousal. So let's just say that lifting heavy weights gets my blood pumping, gets the juices flowing, um, you know, gets me a little bit aroused. Well, then the arousal theory would say that That's my motivation. I'm motivated by that arousal. However, you could also look at it too and say that, you know, after you work out, you have this release of endorphins and that gives you a level of physiological arousal that you didn't have before and you need that. And I think that that's kind of where you would apply the arousal theory in this case because I think it's pretty well characterized that that release of endorphins after you work out is one of the motivators to go do it, right? You feel great after you do it. 
Um, and so that's where I would kind of apply the arousal theory by saying that that release of endorphins gives you some level of arousal that makes you then want to go do that activity again in order to maintain your internal balance of arousal. The next theory I want to talk about is called incentive theory. And this is a pretty basic theory, but it says that we are motivated to act by some external reward. Um, And so this is kind of connected to operant conditioning. If you want to learn more about that, go listen to the learning podcast. But essentially it says that an individual makes an association between a particular behavior and a consequence or a reward. And then it says that they are more likely to abstain from some behavior if they receive a punishment for that behavior. And they are more likely to sustain some behavior if they receive a reward for that behavior. And so again, all the incentive theory is saying is that we're motivated by some external reward. So you can kind of see how that's pretty easily connected to operant conditioning. And so if I were to apply this to this weightlifting scenario, I would say that I am motivated to go work out because there is some reward when I'm done. And there's a few different rewards that I can think of. The first being that afterwards I typically make like a really tasty protein shake. And so when I'm even working out, I I definitely think to myself like, man, I can't wait for my protein shake at the end. Um, And then, of course, 15-year-old me would have said, well, the girls are going to find me a lot more attractive if I work out and if I have muscles. On the other hand, 24-year-old me would say the same thing. Um, And so again, incentive theory would just say that I'm motivated to go work out because I get some reward at the end of my workout. Um, And again, this reward has to be external. So it can't just be that I want to do this because I enjoy doing it and I'm internally motivated to do this. This is some external reward I'm receiving at the end. So that's incentive theory. The next theory I want to talk about is called the need or three needs theory. And this was developed by psychologist David McClelland. And it says that people are driven or motivated by three particular things. The first is the need for achievement, um, i.e. to reach a goal. The second is the need for power or the need to control and influence others. And the last is the need for affiliation or the need for belonging to a group. So again, that's um, the need for achievement, power, and affiliation. Those are the three things that motivate people. And McClellan said that people are motivated by all three of these at the same time, but each person has a dominant motivator. Um, You know, take for instance politicians. Some people would say that politicians are driven by power. And I'm not agreeing and I'm not disagreeing. I'm just saying some people say. Um, So let's apply this then to our weightlifting situation. Um, It would say that depending on the person, we are motivated to lift weights either by achievement, by power, or by affiliation. Let's say that for myself, I am mostly driven by achievement. So this theory would say that I'm motivated to lift weights because I love achieving new maxes. And by maxes, I just mean uh, the max amount of weight I can lift. Or maybe I'm motivated by affiliation, um, in which case I would say that I go to the gym to hang out with other people, you know, be social, talk, be part of the quote unquote weightlifters group. So to quickly summarize the needs or three needs theory, it basically says that we're motivated by either achievement, power, or affiliation, and that people can be motivated by all three of these at the same time to complete some activity or to behave in a certain way, but that one of these is the dominant motivator. The next motivational theory I want to talk about is called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs, and it was developed by Abraham Maslow. And it says that we are motivated to act based upon a hierarchy of our needs. And typically you'll see this displayed as a pyramid with the bottom of the pyramid being our most important needs and the top of the pyramid being our least important needs. And basically it says that we need to fulfill these lower level needs before we can progress and meet these higher level needs. If you're able to Google a picture of this pyramid, you should do so. But essentially at the bottom of this pyramid are physiological needs. The next level are safety needs. The third level is the need to be loved or the need to belong. 
The fourth level of need is esteem, and the last level of need is self-actualization. And so again, these needs are organized in terms of their importance. Um, and as you go up the pyramid, those are less and less important needs. And so this hierarchy says that we essentially start by fulfilling our physiological needs, then moving on to safety, then moving on to love and belonging, then esteem, then self-actualization. And this actually kind of makes a bit of sense to me. right? Have you ever tried doing homework or studying while you're hungry? It sucks. It's like you have this... Uh, hunger in the back of your head and you're trying to study, you're trying to learn, but it's it's hard. You got this in the, in the back of your head. And so, you know, I go eat, come back and I'm like, you know, I'm snappy. I'm, I'm right on it. And so Maslow would say, yeah, you need to meet those physiological needs before that you can then be motivated to do these higher order um, activities or behaviors like study. And so what would Maslow say about our motivation to go lift weights. Well, Maslow would probably say that you need to have your other needs met before you are motivated to go to the gym and lift weights. So let's just say that for me, uh, my weightlifting need fulfills that esteem uh, requirement on the pyramid. So that means that I need to be physiological, physiologically set, meaning I'm not hungry, you know, I'm not too tired to go lift weights. Uh, I'm, I'm feeling good there. Then I need to feel safe, and I need to feel loved. And so, you know, maybe maybe I skip going to the gym to go to a happy hour with some coworkers because I need to fill that need. Um, and then once I go to that happy hour, I go lift weights, which uh, you know might be a bad decision because now you're going to feel like shit with you know a bunch of alcohol in your stomach or, or food or whatever it is. But you need to meet those needs before, so then you are motivated to fulfill that esteem part of the pyramid with weightlifting. All right, the last thing I want to talk about in terms of motivation are motivation for harmful or addictive behaviors. And I think the opponent process theory really is a good theory to describe why people are motivated to do harmful behaviors or become addicted to things like drugs. So the opponent process theory says that when we experience some emotion, we later experience the opposite of that emotion. So let's say we experience joy at some point. Well, then the opponent process theory would say that at some time in the future, we're going to feel sad. And that this sadness is actually a direct result of feeling joyful earlier on. And in terms of the theory, this first emotional response is called the primary process. And then the second emotion is called a secondary process or opponent process. So when you see those terms, that's what those mean. The theory goes on to say that with repeated exposure to a certain situation or a certain behavior, the primary process, which the example I'm using is joy, becomes weaker while the opponent process, which... I'm saying is sadness in this example, is strengthened over time. So again, primary process over time gets weaker. The opponent process gets stronger. And so a lot of times people use this theory to explain why people skydive or their motivations for skydiving. Um, And so I'll give this example. So when a skydiver first jumps, the primary process is fear, right? You're jumping out of a plane, It's freaking scary. Um, I would never do it. But when you land, you get this secondary or opponent process of extreme joy, right? You're like, I'm safe. I landed. This is awesome. And so over time, as you do more and more skydiving, this primary process of fear weakens and weakens while the secondary or opponent process strengthens. So you get more and more joy out of skydiving and less and less fear, which explains why people who skydive tend to keep doing it again and again and again. I also want to explain how this theory is used to describe addiction. So let's talk about this in terms of opioid addiction, just because that's a current problem that's facing the healthcare system in the U.S. So let's say that Joe takes Vicodin for the first time after a hip surgery. Um, Let's say he tore his labrum in his hip while he was playing soccer. And at first, when he takes his Vicodin, he gets a very euphoric feeling that he really likes. And this, this is that primary process, that feeling of euphoria. But afterwards, he gets a bit depressed. Um, and that's because of this opponent process. And this depression lasts you know, a few hours, no big deal. 
So then Joe decides to take another Vicodin. And at this point, he likes that high, doesn't mind this short period of depression afterwards, um, you know, but maybe needs this pain medication for his hip. And again, he feels a bit euphoric at the beginning. Uh, maybe it lasts a little bit shorter this time. But then afterwards, it's a bit longer period of depression after he comes down from this euphoric feeling. And after a while, he starts having to take two Vicodin because this one Vicodin doesn't quite make him feel as euphoric as it used to. And again, this just increases the amount of depression he feels after the euphoria that the Vicodin give him. And over time, this addiction just keeps getting worse and worse because this primary process or that euphoric feeling decreases and the after effects, which is known as the opponent process, keeps increasing. And so if you were to look at Joe later on in this addiction, you'd say, why is he motivated to keep taking this drug, right? He doesn't really get much of a high from it, but he gets this horrible withdrawal symptoms after. Like, what are you doing, man? Well, what, what you wouldn't really understand is the fact that when he was first taking that drug, right, there was hardly any withdrawal, but there was a high euphoria. So that caused him to take more and more and more to chase that high um, until he reached a point where he wasn't really experiencing the high and just experiencing the withdrawal effects and um, then needed to take that drug to kind of get rid of the withdrawal effects. So overall, the opponent process theory says that individuals get addicted to uh, drugs, in this case opioids, because Initially, when it's taken, you experience this very high positive um, feeling that is followed by this bad feeling, but the bad feeling is not that bad. Then over time, this good feeling decreases while the bad feeling or withdrawal increases. Um, And by the time you're really hooked on it, basically it's all withdrawal and you're just taking that drug to get rid of the withdrawal. Maslow's hierarchy of needs can also be referenced to talk about addiction and motivations for addiction. Um, you know, after somebody has been addicted to some substance for a certain amount of time, typically a long time, it becomes a physiological need, right? And, and then and then this need falls within that bottom layer of the pyramid, and you have to meet that need before you can do other things in your life. So again, you know, I need to do my homework, but I am addicted to Vicodin. Well, now I need to take a Vicodin before I can do my homework in order to fulfill that need. So that can also kind of get to the motivations for continuing to take these substances. And before I move on to emotion, I wanted to briefly mention some of the biological or physiological changes that occur when someone is addicted to a drug or some substance. One of the most well-characterized things that can occur for someone who is addicted to drugs is that you can have a decrease in the amount of neurotransmitter receptors on postsynaptic neurons. So some drugs actually block the reuptake of dopamine by the presynaptic neuron. That means that this neuron cannot reuptake that neurotransmitter that's been released into the synaptic cleft, meaning that there's going to be just a shit ton of dopamine floating around and binding to the post-synaptic neuron, causing this euphoric feeling. And the body is pretty amazing, um, and it, it can make homeostatic changes in response to this. So what happens is it stops producing as many dopamine receptors on the postsynaptic neuron. Um, it, it essentially ju- adjusts for the fact that now you're flooding this synapse with dopamine. And so, of course, this lasts when you're not high. And so now you have you know, the regular amount of dopamine in your synaptic cleft, but you have less receptors. And so you get less stimulation of these neurons, and this is going to make you feel depressed, or it's going to give you these withdrawal symptoms that occur in drug addiction. Drugs can also change neuroplasticity, uh, i.e. the hookup of individual neurons. It can basically rewire your brain. Um, And this is part of the reason why adolescent brains are so at risk when it comes to drugs. They are changing at the greatest rate. So 
you know, from the age of, well, I guess from your born up until the age of 22, your brain is changing at a much faster rate than it is from 22 to the rest of your life, right? The brain keeps changing all the time. Um, the difference is that it's changing at a much slower rate as an adult. And so because of this, you know, adolescent brains are really at risk of having significant changes due to drugs, due to changes in neuroplasticity, due to changes in um, you know, neurotransmitter receptors, and so on. Thanks for checking out the Perspective Doctor MCAT Basics podcast. Sam's doing a killer job taking you through the most important MCAT topics. But what if you need a little extra help? How does a 5, 10, or even 15-point increase in your score sound? Imagine how your chances at admission could increase. Med School Coach's MCAT tutoring can get you there. With the most rigorous selection process of any tutoring company, we see amazing results. We deconstruct each student, find a plan that is going to work, and help execute it. That's why our students add an average 12 points to their score. Completely physician-run and operated, and focusing on nothing but medicine. It's no wonder over 10,000 past students have trusted Med School Coach to get them through the MCAT and into medical school. Check out medschoolcoach.com today and mention code PODCAST for 5% off. So let's get now into emotion. So when I talked about motivation, I talked about why we do what we do. What's our motivation? In terms of emotion, I want to talk about the feelings that arise as a result of our motivations or as a result of our actions or behaviors. An emotion is defined as the subjective experiences that involve physiological arousal and cognitive appraisal. In other words, there is a physiological component to emotion, there's a cognitive component to emotion, and there's also a behavioral component to emotion. And these components are all interconnected, right? Your behavior is then going to affect your cognition, and your cognition is going to affect your physiological response, um, etc. Take, for instance, a situation in which you found out that your pet mouse had been murdered. The first thing that is probably going to happen is you're going to have some type of physiological response. Your heart rate is going to increase. You know, you might start to think, am I in immediate danger? Your fight or flight pathways are going to get activated. Um, and then you're going to start to realize the implications of what this means. Your pet mouse is no longer living. You're going to get sad. You're going to get upset. This is going to lead to some type of behavior where, you know, you get angry, maybe you punch the wall, you start to cry, whatever it is um, that leads to behavior. And these are going to feed into each other, right? Um, as you start to cry, that's going to set off more physiological responses. Um, your behavior is going to be tied back into your cognitions. You know, maybe you think, ah, oh, shit, I probably shouldn't punch a hole in the wall. Um, I'm not going to do that right now because it's not a smart thing to do. And so, again, there are three parts to emotion there's a physiological component a cognitive component, and a behavioral component. And before I get into the theories of emotion, I want to talk about emotion in the brain. I want to talk about what areas in the brain are most correlated with emotion. And so emotion involves the entire nervous system. Obviously, all the things that go on within your brain you know, are going to lead to some kind of emotion. But I want to talk about the few specific structures that really deal with emotion. And these three structures are going to be the limbic system, the prefrontal cortex, and the autonomic nervous system. So let's start off with the limbic system. And if you remember back to the nervous system podcast, you can remember hippo hat, which describes some of the main structures in the limbic system, the hippocampus, the hypothalamus, the amygdala, and the thalamus. And so uh, specifically the amygdala has a lot to do with fear and anger. And it also seems to be connected to our emotions and memory, both of which are obviously intertwined, right? If you can't remember your pet mouse being dead, then you're not going to be sad about it. So within the limbic system, the amygdala um, has the biggest connection to emotion. Typically, we think of that um, specifically, specifically being linked to fear and anger. 
The prefrontal cortex, which is the next structure I want to point out, uh, has a lot to do with cognition and higher level processing. You know, why is it that we don't act upon our impulses that come from our amygdala? When we get really angry um, or fearful, we don't just sprint away, we don't just, you know, act with rage and kill somebody because we're able to think, um, think about the consequences, think about, everything that goes into these actions and our prefrontal cortex allows us to do that. You can also think about the prefrontal cortex as modulating our emotions. So you know there's some situations in which we feel an emotion but we don't want to show that we feel that. So you know you might be in a meeting and your boss is saying something that's just complete bullshit or you know calling you out and it's not right what they're doing whatever and you get really pissed but you're not going to show that. I mean, you know, maybe you do, but let's pretend you're not showing that emotion while your prefrontal cortex is helping kind of modulate that emotion and saying, okay, I can't show this right now. When I get home, you know, I'll I'll just take this out on my wife and kids. The third and final structure I want to talk about is the autonomic nervous system. And so the autonomic nervous system obviously controls a lot of the physiological features that come with emotion, your increase in heart rate, increase in sweating. Um, and maybe that sinking feeling in your stomach that you get when you're really sad or something really bad happens, um, I'm guessing is controlled by your autonomic nervous system. I was actually thinking about this when I was writing the podcast, and I don't didn't do any searching to find if this is the truth, but I'm wondering if that sinking feeling is blood being like diverted away from your stomach to other parts in the body because you're having like a fight or flight response. I don't know, but maybe. The next thing I want to talk about are theories of emotion, and this is probably the highest yield portion of this podcast. And the theories that I want to get into are the evolutionary theory or evolutionary perspective of emotion. I want to get into the James Lang theory, the Cannon Bard theory, and the Schachter Singer theory. And then lastly, I'm going to talk about the facial feedback theory. And I'm pulling the James Lang, Cannon Bard, Schachter Singer theory theories from the um, Psych Soch Theories podcast that I did a while back. Um, So hopefully that part is a little bit of review. Those are really important theories, though. You're definitely going to see those on the MCAT. Let's first talk about the evolutionary theory. So this theory, like all pretty much the other evolutionary theories, was developed by Charles Darwin. And it says that emotions or emotional responses are what enabled us to survive and to reproduce. In other words, humans developed emotions because it gave us an advantage that would help us survive and reproduce. Take, for example, the emotion of love. The evolutionary perspective of love would say that humans developed love because it helped them survive and reproduce. And how would it help them survive and reproduce? Well, you know, if you love another individual, maybe you seek that individual out as a mate and then you reproduce with that individual. Or maybe in context of a family, you know, you, the heads of that family, the parents love those children. So then they take care of that children, raise them up, provide protection for that family. And they have a higher likelihood then of reproducing the the physical children themselves um, and then continue to pass on those genes. Another emotion you can consider is fear. The evolutionary perspective would say that people feel fear because that's what causes them to um, act in situations of danger and avoid death. So, you know, you see a bear coming at you. Why do you get afraid? Well, you get afraid because that bear is in immediate danger and it's probably going to eat you. And that would not allow you then to pass on your genes and reproduce. So over time, people evolve these emotions then, specifically fear, to avoid danger and to avoid death. So in summary, the evolutionary theory of emotion says that we developed emotions or emotional responses because that enabled us to survive and to reproduce. All right, let's get into the four main theories to know, which are James Lang theory, Cannon Bard, the Schachter Singer theory, and the Lazarus theory, which I failed to mention in the intro. And this is from an old podcast, uh, but here you go. All right, so uh, before I start, I just want you to put yourself into the situation that I'm going to use as an example for each of these emotional theories. So let's just say you've been at work all day, you've worked a 10-hour day, and 
you get off work and now you got to walk home. You walk home a mile, you know, long walk, you're tired, you're hangry, you know, you're pissed off, whatever. And you get home, you open the door, and all of a sudden you hear the clanking of your dog's tags um, against their neck. And your dog runs up to you and, you know, super happy to see you. And all of a sudden, you know, all that weight from work is lifted off your shoulders. You're super happy um, and you forget all about your long day at work. All right, so now that you're familiar with the situation that you're in, let's introduce these different theories. All right, so the James Lang theory of emotion says that the experience of emotion is due to the perception of a physiological response. In other words, there is some event that occurs, and because of that you get some physiological arousal, and then you interpret that arousal, and then that's what leads to emotion. So that's the James Lang theory of emotion. And so how do we apply this to the situation that I just described? Well, the James Lang theory says that when you see your dog, you have a physiological response, which is say that endorphins are released. And then what happens is your brain actually interprets that physiological response and says, okay, you're releasing endorphins, you must be happy. And from there, you have an emotion in which you are happy to see your dog um, after your long day at work. And what's important to note here is that James and Lang both theorized that the emotions came directly because of the physiological response. The next theory is called the Cannon-Bard theory of emotion. And so this states that the physiological response and emotional response towards a stimulus occur simultaneously. In other words, you have some stimulus and then you have an emotional response and a physiological response at the same time. So applying this to our dog situation again, what happens is that you see your dog as you walk in the door, and then simultaneously you start to release endorphins and experience emotion, both again, again, both of these at the same time. Next, the Schachter-Singer theory states that emotion is based on two factors. And that is the physiological arousal and the cognitive label assigned to that situation or stimulus. And so essentially what this says is that you have a physiological response and then you use your current cognition in order to assign meaning. In other words, we don't feel emotion until we are able to identify the situation um, that we're in. And this is what sets it apart from the James Lang theory because they, they do sound kind of similar. So, so in other words, for the Schachter-Singer theory, you must interpret the situation before you feel an emotion. For the James Lang theory, the emotional response is due to the physiological response. So again, let's apply this to the example of your dog. So you see your dog and this causes you to release endorphins or or. Um, experience some sort of physiological response. And so then after you have this physiological response, you identify the reason for the physiological response. You say, okay, uh, my dog's happy to see me after this shitty day that I've had. And then that is what brings about this emotion of happiness. And again, the difference between the Shakhtar Singer and James Lang is that the physiological response is not causing the emotion for the Schachter singer. Instead, you must identify the reason um, for this physiological response before you experience the emotion. The last theory of emotion is called the Lazarus theory. And the Lazarus theory says that the experience of emotion depends on how the situation is appraised or labeled. So going back to the situation of the dog... You see your dog, and the first thing you do is you appraise the situation. You say, oh, my dog's happy to see me. Look at that, my dog wagging its tail, its tongue's out. It's a freaking cute dog, you know, maybe it's a golden retriever, which is the cutest dog, by the way. And so, yeah, so you appraise the situation. And then what happens next is you have a physiological response, which is the release of endorphins, and you experience emotion, and those occur at the same time. So um, I think the main thing to remember about the Lazarus theory is that you must first appraise the situation. 
Anytime you see on the MCAT appraisal in the context of emotion, you should automatically think Lazarus. All right, before I move on to the next part, I want to teach you a little mnemonic or a little saying in order to keep all three of these theories straight. So when you think of James Lang, think of James Bond and how he's always involved in action. And so uh, this makes me think then that the in the James Lang theory, our body must first act, um, i.e. have a physiological response before we can experience the emotion. So James Lang, James Bond, action. And then for the cannon barred theory, imagine a bad cannon, right? And so when this bad cannon shoots, it actually hits two separate points, kind of like makes a V as it shoots out, hits a high point, hits a low point. And um, you could essentially imagine that these two targets are the two different factors that the cannon barred theory says are happening simultaneously, right? Which says that you have an emotional response and physiological response simultaneously. So cannon barred, bad cannon, um, two simultaneous targets. For the Schachter Singer theory, I think two S's, which reminds me of two factors. And so in this theory, there's two factors, right? You must have a physiological response or physiological arousal. And then you also must have some understanding of the surrounding around you. You must have some cognition about the surroundings in order to then have an emotional response. So Schachter Singer, two S's, two factor theory. And in full disclosure, I took some of those kind of sayings from people on Reddit I I just really like that. And I actually did use this on the test when I studied. So um, keep that in mind. All right. So I want to thank Old Me for recording that. I really appreciate it. Um, The last theory that I want to talk about here, and I didn't mention in that previous podcast, was the facial feedback theory. So what is a facial feedback theory? Well, it suggests that facial expressions directly influence our emotions and not the other way around, which is kind of how I'm used to thinking about it at least, right? Typically, I think when I get sad, I first get sad in my head and then it makes me frown. And I'm frowning because I'm sad. I'm not sad because I'm frowning, which is exactly what the facial feedback theory says, that you're actually unhappy because you're frowning, which is weird. Um, But this theory was first suggested by Strack, Martin, and Stepper in this 1988 paper. And it said that it found, I'm I'm quoting here, it said that it found that asking participants to generate smile-related expressions led them to report enhanced positive affect, whereas having them inhibit smile-related expressions by activating opposing muscles, i.e. frowning, weakened positive affect. In other words, what they suggested was that when people smiled, the smiling itself actually made them feel happier, whereas when they were frowning or kind of holding back a smile, they felt sadder. So from this, they developed the facial feedback theory that says that expressions directly influence our emotions. And they showed some decent evidence for this, but I'm kind of skeptical. You know, if I was to walk around with a smile all day, um, first of all, I would look weird and I'd probably get feedback from other people that would make me less happy, but I don't really think that would affect my feelings that much or or my mood um, or my emotion. But, you know, maybe there is some truth to this, maybe just a little bit that like tensing your face in a specific pattern, you know, your brain recognizes that and then somehow signals it to be happy. I don't really know. Um, I just know that they found this effect exists. Um, and, and that it is there to a certain extent. Again, that is the facial feedback theory. All right, so those are the theories of emotion to know. Really focus on the James Lang, Cannon Bard, Schachter Singer, and the Lazarus theory. The next thing I want to talk about here is the six universal emotions. And these are emotions that apply universally across different cultures. And this was developed by Paul Ekman, who's a pretty famous uh, psychologist. And he theorized that these six universal emotions are happiness, sadness, anger, surprise, fear, and disgust. And further, he went on to say that each of these universal emotions comes with a clearly defined facial expression. And 
Um, you can go look these up if you want. You see a bunch of different faces, and you know you could probably point to each one and say, "Oh yeah, that's happiness. Oh, that's sadness. That's fear. That's surprise. Whatever it may be, you can pretty much recognize these faces as you look at them." And um, you know, so would other cultures, right? So would people in Japan. So, so would people in China. So, so would people in Mexico. So would people in South America. And I do want to mention that different cultures can have their own emotional responses. And this can happen in a few different ways. Um, Mainly that different cultures influence the way people regulate their emotions. For instance, there might be social consequences for displaying certain emotions. You know, for instance, men are sometimes ostracized in places like the U.S. for crying or for displaying too much emotion in general. In Eskimo populations, uh, people are sometimes ostracized for actually displaying too much anger, which is something I learned, didn't know that. In addition to this, social values of certain cultures can also affect emotions. So for instance, in the U.S., we tend to be a more individualistic Western society, whereas with a lot of different Asian cultures, like Japan, they tend to be more group or community-based societies. And so research has shown, shown that individuals from the United States are more likely to express negative emotions such as fear, anger, and disgust, both alone and in the presence of others, while as Japanese individuals are more likely to do so only while alone. In other words, there's a cultural difference in the fact that Japanese individuals don't like to display their emotions when they're around other people, um, specifically their family. And the authors of this paper theorized that this was because the Japanese have this closer, more tight-knit culture, and that essentially they saw these showing the, these shows of emotions, and especially of negative emotions, as a threat to this cohesion um, that was really important to their culture. So that's kind of interesting and just one of the instances of cultural differences in emotion. All right, so the last thing I want to do here is I want to go over emotional disorders that you might see on the MCAT. And I'm going to go through a few different disorders. I'm going to go through depressive disorders, anxiety-based disorders, obsessive-compulsive disorder, and then lastly I'll talk about bipolar disorders. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through first the symptoms of these disorders and then talk about their biological causes, if they are known, and a little foreshadowing. The causes of these disorders are pretty much unknown. All right, I'm going to start by talking about depressive disorders. So depressive disorders are marked by a long-term depressed mood and lack of motivation to engage in previously enjoyable activities. So the symptoms are things like changes in eating patterns, sleeping, loss of interest, persistent sadness, and so on. In terms of the biological cause, it's not really well characterized. There is a pretty well characterized heritability factor, though, which is about uh, 40%. And people often cite brain chemistry changes. I'm sure that's something you've heard of. Um, you know, it's, it's a change in brain chemistry that it is responsible for these diseases, or or these depressive disorders. And there are definitely some things that change in the brain um, that have been observed in these depressive disorders. First of all, there is a decrease in frontal lobe size and a decrease in some neurotransmitters, which are epinephrine, dopamine, serotonin. You have an increase in limbic structure size, increase in stress hormones, and tend to have an increase in glucose metabolism in the amygdala, which the amygdala, again, is involved with a fear um, or anger response. And then you also tend to have abnormal neuroplasticity or a difference in the way that the neurons are hooked up. Now these could be the causes of depression. These could be the symptoms of depression. We don't really know. The next disorder I want to talk about are anxiety disorders. And these include things like generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder, phobia-related disorders, and post-traumatic stress disorder. The symptoms for generalized anxiety order are excessive anxiety or worrying that persists longer than six months. And this tends to go on and affect different aspects of people's everyday lives, like working, like school, like relationships, etc. Panic disorder, on the other hand, are recurrent unexpected panic attacks, 
Um, and panic attacks are sudden periods of intense fear that come on quickly and reach their peak within minutes. And these attacks can be brought on unexpectedly. There can be a trigger like you know giving a group presentation or something like that in front of a bunch of people. Um, whatever that is, you can have a trigger for these panic attacks. And during these panic attacks, you're going to have accelerated heart rate, sweating, shaking, um, a lot of those type of symptoms. In terms of its biological cause, again, there's not much that's known about the particular cause. We do know that it's partially heritable, and the heritability factor is somewhere between 30 and 60%. And in terms of what we observe as a result, or what biological changes we see as a result of these anxiety disorders, is we see it changes in a brain structure. There tends to be an increased gray matter volume in the amygdala, similar to what I said about the depressive disorders. We also notice that the gray matter volume in the right pitumen, which involved, which the pitumen is involved in what's known as this hate circuit. Um, and in, in short, the hate circuit is something that gets activated when we see something that we really don't like or that we hate. Um, and so that kind of makes sense too, right? If you're having this enlargement of this area that deals with hate or you know, seeing things we hate, that makes sense, and it might cause some sort of anxiety disorder. And then we also tend to see lower gray matter volume in the hippocampus, specifically with PTSD. Um, and then the second thing we see, is we see more activation of anxiety pathways in the brain, especially, especially in the amygdala. Then you also see changes in neurotransmitters. So you can see that some of the things we see within the brain comparing anxiety disorders to depressive disorders are fairly similar. Obsessive compulsive disorder is the next one I want to talk about. And the symptoms are reoccurring thoughts, which are known as obsessions, and or behaviors, which are known as compulsions, that are repeated over and over again. And I think one of the main things to know about this disorder in terms of the MCAT is the difference between those obsessions and those compulsions. Obsessions are things like beliefs that certain numbers or colors are good or bad, or being overly concerned about germs. They're reoccurring thoughts, not necessarily behaviors. Compulsions, on the other hand, are behaviors like ordering things in a precise order, repeated hand washing, pacing back and forth repeatedly, um, or even repeatedly cleaning things. And this is kind of crude, but the way I remembered this is I remembered I am obsessed with thoughts, like T-H-O-T-S. I am obsessed with thoughts. And so, you know, if that helps you remember, remember that, and then you'll be able to link thoughts, obsessions together, um, get that right on the MCAT. The biological causes, again, are pretty much unknown, although we do know it is, again, heritable. The heritability value there is about 45%. And one thing that's interesting is we see obsessions and compulsions in other medical conditions, including things like um, encephalitis in the brain, Parkinson's disease, Tourette disorder, schizophrenia, a lot of these other disorders that you know affect the brain, we can tend to see obsessions and compulsions. So that leads us to say that there's something in the brain that's not going quite right, which doesn't say a lot. Um, in people who have obsessive compulsive disorder. Lastly, I want to talk about bipolar disorders. So bipolar disorder, which is also known as manic depressive disorder, is a brain disorder that causes unusual shifts in mood, you know, from highs to lows throughout the day. And it typically, like these other disorders, affect the ability to carry out day-to-day -day tasks like work, school, etc. So basically what happens is you have these really big ups in mood called mania, and then you hit these big depressions in mood or, or downs, which are known as depression. Um, in other words, in order to simplify this into a few words, you could, you could call it mood swings. And you do need to know the difference between bipolar 1 disorder and bipolar 2 disorder. So bipolar 1 disorder is when you swing from mania to major depression, uh, back up to mania, back down to major depression. So you're swinging between those two states. On the other hand, bipolar 2 disorder, you're swinging from hypomania to major depression and then back up to hypomania. And all hypomania is is a mood elevation that doesn't quite reach the levels of being 
full, uh, full on mania. So it's, it's, you have this euphoric feeling, but you're not quite all the way up to mania. So in other words, in bipolar one disorder, you're going from having this really high uh, euphoric feeling of mania all the way down to major depression. Whereas with bipolar two, you're going from hypomania, which isn't quite up as high as mania, down again to major depression. You can go Google these and see these graphically. I think that helps um, in order to see kind of the difference between hypomania and mania. You can kind of get a better view of that. Um, One thing that has helped me remember these two is that I remember that they are ordered in terms of of their mania. So bipolar 1 is full-blown mania, whereas in bipolar 2 is hypomania. Um, And so I just remember that they're just numerically ordered in terms of their degree of mania. And in terms of the biological basis for bipolar disorder, again, there is no unified theory of the cause of bipolar disorder, there is a really large heritability factor, which is interesting, somewhere in the range of 70 to 80%. Um, your relative risk of having bipolar disorder, if you have a relative who has it, is about 7 to 10, which is a pretty big relative risk. Just to kind of put this in perspective, the relative risk of getting lung cancer if you smoke cigarettes is about 20. So that's only basically double the risk of you having bipolar disorder if one of your relatives does, which is pretty crazy. Um, And because of this high degree of heritability, scientists have looked for genetic mutations that may predispose people to have a bipolar disorder, and there's not really been any found so far, which to me is pretty interesting. That's, That's kind of crazy that they haven't found a specific genetic marker of bipolar disorder, but the heritability is so high. Um, they've also noticed that there's changes in neurotransmitters that are correlated with bipolar disorder. Specifically, there's an increase in norepinephrine, epinephrine, and dopamine in mania. And then there are sub- subsequent decreases once depression sets in. They've also recognized an increase in glutamine that has been observed in post-mortem brains of people with bipolar disorder. Um, But I'd say the biggest thing to understand here for the MCAT is knowing the difference between bipolar 1 and bipolar 2. And that concludes this episode of Perspective Doctor's MCAT Basics on Motivation and Emotion. I hope that this helped as you study. If you feel it did, please go give us a review on iTunes. I love seeing it, and it helps us reach other students. You know, if you want to leave an email as well, the email is in the show notes. I like hearing that feedback. You know, sometimes people make corrections, and I always post those corrections in the show notes. And as always, thanks for listening, and good luck as you study. Thanks for listening to Prospective Doctors MCAT Podcast. If you're a pre-med, you'll want to check out prospectivedoctor.com for tons of free tools, articles, and more podcasts that cover your pre-med life. And if you need help on the MCAT or getting into med school, check out medschoolcoach.com for the experts.